Hi, and welcome to the first of quite a few videos that I'm going to make which will take you through the text of Twelfth Night. I'm going to focus on the text more than anything else. Uh, these videos are suitable for undergraduates, A-level students, even GCSE students. Um, I teach Twelfth Night for edXL. edXL requires context. I will be talking about context as I go through the text, but I shall probably have a couple of videos at the end summing up themes, uh, perhaps essay techniques, and uh, context as a whole. But I'm just going to dive straight into what is, in my opinion, Shakespeare's best play. I think it's the most perfect play that he's written. Um, that's whether comedy or tragedy. Uh, and as we go through the play, I'll be explaining why I think that. Obviously, the play starts with Duke Orsino, starts in Illyria, um, and it starts with one of the most famous lines in Shakespeare, if not in literature. If music be the food of love, play on. What I've done is I've gone through the text. As I've, I've put a few pointers in the uh, on the side of the, the text. Uh, if you want to refer to those, you can as I talk. But I'll be saying lots of other things as well. Um, as I've highlighted in that first line, music, food, and love, three key themes or motifs throughout the play. Um, it's one of Shakespeare's most musical plays. It has lots of songs. Um, the verse is beautiful. There's quite a lot of rhyme in there. Um, and it's also uh, about food in terms of it's about excess. It's about uh, enjoyment. It's about the good life as um, Sir Andrew mistakenly um, discusses later in the play. And of course it's about love. Well, it's a Shakespeare comedy. Shakespeare's comedies, as I'm sure you know, end in marriage. They always do. That's the definition of a Shakespearean comedy. And there is plenty of love in this play and plenty of marriage. So even in that very first line, if music be the food of love, play on, we see that Shakespeare is introducing his themes to the audience. But Orsino's a bit of a strange man, as we can see if we read the first few lines. If music be the food of love, play on, give me excess of it, that surfeiting the appetite may sicken and so die. Slightly strange man. Music is, is, is the food of love, so he wants so much. He wants to stuff himself full of uh, an excess of music, an excess of love, so that he can basically throw up and perhaps die as a result. The appetite may sicken and so die, or the appetite may die, I suppose, is, is, is the truth of it. Um, this is the sort of melancholy man that Orsino is. He wants to revel in his melancholy. He wants to revel in, uh, in the unrequited love that he feels. Um, surfeiting, of course, means having too much. And that is, again, one of the key themes of this play, having too much, uh, as Sir Toby and Sir Andrew um, will find, sometimes doesn't always uh, work. But he's listening to music in the court, and uh, he likes the music, that strain again, he wants that little bit again. Can you just play that again, please, musicians? Um, it had a dying fall. So again, we see that, that, that Shakespeare is, whilst this is beautiful verse, he's also bringing in a darker edge in terms of the word die and the dying fall. A dying fall is a cadence, it's a musical term, um, and uh, and yet obviously the, the, the mere mention of those words, die and dying, makes us see the melancholy that is in Orsino. Um, but it's beautiful. Oh, it came on my ear like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odour beautiful mix of sound and smell, as I've written there, um, use of the senses, the sweet sound, so it tastes, you can hear it, it breathes, you can feel it, a stealing and giving odour, and then suddenly he's had enough, because Orsino is changeable. Uh, we'll see this a number of times in the play. Um, enough, no more. Stop playing. Stop the music, please. Tis not so sweet now as it was before. And then he decides to discuss the nature of love, spirit of love, how quick and fresh art thou, 
um, again, looking at the senses, lively, fresh, um, that notwithstanding thy capacity receiveth as the sea, naught enters there of what validity and pitch soe'er, but falls into abatement and low price, even in a minute. That's a convoluted sentence. It's basically saying, you know, love's as big as the sea. You can throw whatever you like in it. And unfortunately, according to Orsino, it falls into abatement. It it, it's belittled. It's it's debased by um, going into the into the water, <clears throat> and and this happens really quickly, even in a minute. He's explaining why he's so changeable. He's explaining that you know, well, I was enjoying that music, and now I've gone off it. And he says that's what love does to him. Um, interesting that he says, you know, uh, the spirit of love is fresh, and then he talks about the sea. This is a this is a salt water, fresh water theme that we we see again and again in the play. Um, but of course, mention of the sea. We know this is an island, or we'll soon find out it's an island, and we know, or we'll soon find out that uh, there has been a shipwreck. We're going to see Viola and Sebastian uh, wrecked onto the onto the shores. Finally, he says, so full of shapes is fancy that it alone is high fantastical. So love is uh, it's it's stuff of the imagination. He seems to be saying, full of shapes. It's high fantastical. It's it works in in a really heightened manner in the imagination. So he's. He's spending time examining the nature of love. Um, I, I do think that he's a he's a bit of a, a teenage romantic. He's a he's a melancholic teenager who wants to shut himself in his bedroom and draw the curtains and maybe paint the walls black and uh, and and then just sort of think deep things about love and life and all that sort of thing. It gets on my nerves a bit, I have to say. So Curio obviously gets on Curio's nerves too because Curio says, you know, come on, let's take you out, of, take take you out of all this. Um, we'll see, you know, let's um, shall we? Should we go hunt? Should we? Let's go and have a bit of fun. Um, bad thing to do, really. Um, Will you go hunt, my lord? Duke Orsino says, what, Curio? What, what shall I go and hunt? And of course, Curio says, the heart. Oh, no, wrong thing to say to this, to this strange man. Ah, why, so I do the noblest that I have. So he's punning immediately. Heart, meaning a, a deer. But in this case, he's talking about, of course, his heart in terms of love. Um, he's He is hunting a heart. He is hunting the noblest heart. And that is Olivia's heart, the noblest that I have, or when mine eyes did see Olivia first, me thought she purged the air of pestilence. So first of all, it's a compliment for Olivia. Um, and, you know, she purged the air of pestilence, like the, the sweet uh, smells that they, uh, of course, in the plague times in the 17th century and 16th century, they used to try and dispel the, 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 the plague by having herbs and flowers and things to smell that they thought would get rid of the disease, um, nosegays. Um, and uh, of course we've got a mention of pestilence here, uh, which is a good context point. But he goes into Greek uh, myth here, that instant was I turned into a heart, so we're back to a deer again, and my desires like fell and cruel hounds e'er since pursue me. So from the story of Actaeon, I've made the note there, uh, um, Diana was bathing um, and uh, Actium was peeping through the th through the bushes, trying to catch a glimpse of her. And as a result, um, she turned his dogs on him, turned him into a stag, and he was chased through the woods by his own dogs. Interesting that Orsino says that his own desires are pursuing him. Is is it that? He desires himself. Is he sick of self-love, as Malvolio later is is told? Um, but of course, as I say, you know the melancholic is a bit like Romeo at the beginning of Romeo and Juliet. He he can't stop thinking about love. Oh, the heart. Oh, love. Oh, Olivia. And he would just won't shut up about it. And you get a bit tired of it, really. Uh, but of course, Valentine comes back now from Olivia's house, um, and Orsino is is very keen to know what news there is. How now? What news from her? And we find out about Olivia. Olivia is in mourning. Uh, so please, my lord, I might not be admitted, but from her handmaid do we return this answer. The element itself, 
against the sun till seven years heat shall not behold her face at ample view. So she's going to hide away. She's in mourning, she's going to veil her face, as was traditional in those days, uh, like a cloistress, like a nun, um, a nun who sits in the convent and is not allowed to see men. Very appropriate. She will veiled walk and water once a day her chamber round with eye offending brine. She will cry. Brine, oh, we're back to salt water again. Um, eye offending because it, it makes your eyes red when you cry. Um, and, and she's going to preserve all this to season a brother's dead love. So like preserving meat on a sea journey. Oh, perhaps a little reference to the sea again, just slightly. Um, to season a brother's dead love. She's going to keep it fresh, like keeping meat um, for a long time by salting it. Um, again, fresh, salt, see what Shakespeare's doing there, which she would keep fresh and lasting in her sad remembrance. Um, and so Olivia does not want to see or see no. Is this going to put him off? Of course not. Is he going to see this as rejection? Of course not. Oh, no, not Orsino, not Mr. Arrogant. Oh, she that hath the heart of that fine frame to pay this debt of love but to a brother. How will she love when the rich golden shaft have killed the flock of all affections else that live in her? When liver, brain, and heart, those sovereign thrones, are all supplied and filled her sweet perfections with who? Orsino, of course, one self-king. Me. Oh, well, if she can love her brother that much. Oh, she that hath the heart of that fine frame. But to a brother, you know, dead brother, what's she going to be like when she meets me? How will she love when the rich golden shaft, that's Cupid's arrow, of course, um, has made her fall in love uh, with me? Liver, brain and heart, they're all um, the seats of, uh, as I've noted there, passion, thought and sentiment. Um, passion in the liver. I'm not quite sure if Valentine cards would work quite so well with, you know, I love you with all my liver. But you know, who knows? And um, so everything is going to be filled with me. Um, one self king. I will be the king. Self-love again, perhaps. Um, I will be the king and enthroned in her liver, brain and heart. What should we do now? Well, we've been rejected by Olivia. So should we should we go and sit in some flowers and think about love? Uh, one of the things, yes, he's arrogant. Yes, he's changeable. Yes, he's a melancholic late teenager but I also think he's a bit of a hippie you know he likes to sort of sit in flowers man and like sort of talk about love away before me the sweet beds of flowers man love thoughts lie rich when canopied with bowers and the scene ends with a rhyming couplet as Shakespeare often does in scene two we find one of the other key players uh, and that is of course Viola she's a gentlewoman um, the captain gives her due um, respect as a result of that. Um, she's shipwrecked. Uh, she's gone through quite a lot of uh, torment. She thinks she's lost her brother. Let's see what she says. What should I do? Uh, sorry, what country friends is this? This is Illyria, lady, says the captain. Well, what should I do in Illyria, my brother? He is in Elysium. Right from the start, we can see that Viola is a clever, witty uh, young woman. I mean, she's witty because she plays with language. Um, and of course, Shakespeare will love anybody who does something like that. Illyria, Elysium, Elysium, another word for heaven. My brother is in heaven. Why am I here? Um, but perchance he is not drowned. What think you say? There's perchance, perhaps, perhaps he's not drowned. Well, the captain says, well, you were saved. Chance that you were saved, by chance you, you, you were saved. So he's being kindly towards her, and she thinks, yeah, maybe, perchance, maybe my brother was saved too. And the captain says, well, I saw him comfort you with chance, assure you after our ship did split, when you and those poor number saved with you hung on our driving boat, I saw your brother, uh, basically he saw him tied to a, a, a mast, and he rowed upon the sea like Arion on the dolphin's back, uh, who was Arion, um, Greek musician and poet, says my little note here, who, who sang songs to charm a dolphin, um, songs, music, 
once again we're we're back to that um and he survived just like arian did so uh, sorry the the captain hopes that her brother has survived rather like arian did um <clears throat> and excuse me um and uh, this hopefully will will bring hope to Viola, and Viola indeed is is impressed by that for saying so. There's gold. Uh, she is a gentlewoman. Um, mine own escape unfoldeth to my hope, where to thy speech serves for authority. Basically, I'm alive. Maybe he will as well. He will be as well. Uh, so so. Do you know this place, Captain? Yes, says the captain. Well, who's in charge? Oh, a noble duke in nature as in name. What is the name? And his name is Orsino. Um, and Viola says, well, yeah, I've heard my father name him, who's a bachelor. So notice, the captain says he's a noble duke. Uh, you know, Orsino means little bear. A bear was a noble beast. Um, and so, you know, a noble duke. Uh, perhaps referring to his name, um, but Viola interestingly refers to her father rather like Olivia does later in the play. Um, well, he, that gives him a bit of credence. It gives him a bit of uh, authority because um, she's heard her father talk about this man. He's well known, and he was a bachelor. <clears throat> now the the point about him being a bachelor is that if you're a bachelor, you only have men in your court. Um, so. That means that Viola can't go there unless, of course, she disguises herself. Uh, and the captain confirms that she that he is a bachelor um, and he's seeking the love of fair Olivia. I do love this little line. Uh, As you know, what great ones do, the less will prattle of. Perfect for social media. Um, you know, celebrities, what they get up, get up to, uh, the lesser folks that's you and me, uh, prattle about it or gossip about it. Um, Shakespeare's so so clever in how he analyses human nature. Um, so he is in love with Olivia. Everybody knows that. Who's she, says Viola? Oh, virtuous maid, the daughter of a count who died, left her in the protection of his son, her brother, who died. Poor Olivia, she's had a bit of a bad year of it. Um, for whose dear love they say she hath abjured the company and sight of men. She is rejected, she has avoided all sight and company of men. And Viola, well, why do you think that Viola sees some kinship with Olivia? Of course she does. Oh, that I serve that lady. I've lost my brother. Um, or so she thinks. Olivia's lost her brother. Then we will. We would have a kinship. Um, till I had made... And might not be delivered to the world. Till I had made mine own occasion mellow what my estate is. So again, a convoluted sentence that seems to suggest... I mean, what I think is, is that Viola's been dumped on this strange island. She's probably lost all of her fine clothes or lots of her fine clothes and her fine possessions um she needs to check the place out she she needs to find out you know where she stands in illyria and so she wants to wait till i had made mine own occasion mellow, mellow wait for the right time wait for the right moment to reveal who she is um she needs to find out what her estate is how she stands um, no, says the captain, you can't do that because she won't let anybody in, not even somebody from the Duke. OK, well, we will see what happens with that later. Um, apologies that I, I created this PDF of the text and uh, did not indent that line. It's it's worth just remembering, as I'm sure you all know. This is a verse, this is blank verse, there's there's a single line there, um, this is also a single line, and that one should be indented and starting there. Um, my mistake, but it, it, it serves to remind us that, remember that Shakespeare's uh, plays were um, often written in verse, in blank verse, and um, there is prose in Twelfth Night, there's both in, in Twelfth Night, but blank verse generally ten syllables to a line, um, and if two characters share a line, then um, it's split, but we count it as just one. It's often in a conversation, 
um, especially perhaps in a row or I think of Macbeth and the night of the murder um, where Lady Macbeth and Macbeth are sharing lines all over the place because of the tension. Um, it's often just to keep the conversation going and it, it, it's almost like a stage direction to the character to pick up on that previous line very quickly uh, and not just wait for it to finish and have a little pause but instead straight on with your line. Um, well, says Viola, and here we hit another one of our themes, um, which is appearance and reality. Uh, well, says Viola, there is a fair behaviour in the captain, and though that nature with a beauteous wall doth oft close in pollution, yet of thee I will believe thou hast a mind that suits with this thy fair and outward character. In other words, often people can look good, but they can be polluted inside. I reckon you look good and you're good inside. I will believe thou hast a mind that suits with this thy fair and outward character. Okay, so um, that is a theme throughout this play. This play is about deception in, in many ways. Um, it's about trickery. It's about disguise. It's about not knowing who people are. It's about not knowing how words can be trusted, letters and so on. Um, so this is a key theme to the play. Um, so she's going to pay him, I prithee, and I'll pay thee bounteously. She's worked out what she's going to do. Conceal me what I am, and be my aid for such disguise, appearance and reality, as haply shall become the form of my intent. I'll serve the Duke. So she's worked it out. Can't go to Olivia. Have to go to the Duke. Can't go to the Duke, because he won't have girls in his court. Right, so I'll disguise myself as a man. So it, it just shows, I've written here, note Viola's intelligence, wit. It just shows she works things out really quickly. She comes up with this idea which Shakespeare drops almost immediately. Thou shalt present me as an eunuch to him. Well, a eunuch is a sort of um, uh, emasculated boy. Um, a, a boy that's uh, possibly being castrated even. Um, and uh, was used in, um, particularly in Turkish harems, as um, uh, entertainment for singing. <clears throat> Thou shalt present me as a eunuch to him, it may be worth thy pains, for I can sing and speak to him in many sorts of music. Well, Viola never sings in this play. Festy does all the singing. So Shakespeare must have changed his mind. Maybe a, an actor was um, uh, available to to play the role of Festy. And Viola didn't do any singing. However, you know, look at this line and speak to him in many sorts of music. Well, she certainly does speak in music. She speaks in verse. She speaks beautifully. When we see her with Olivia pouring out her poetry on behalf of Orsino, it's it's some of the most stunning writing um, that Shakespeare ever did, I think. Um, so she does indeed speak in many sorts of music that will allow me very worth his service. What Else may hap, here's another theme, to time I will commit. Um, time is definitely a motif in this play. I mean, the, the timing of the play is all over the place. You, you know, in three months, three days, uh, we never know how long we're in Illyria with these characters. But we do leave things to time and, and the whole play is, in a way, is a play of waiting. It's a play of waiting for the, the excitement to be unlocked. Uh, by the last few scenes. If you don't know the story, then I'll, you know, spoiler alert. No, actually, I won't spoil it. Uh, Shape thou thy silence to my wit. You've got to be quiet about it. Okay, and then we get this, again, about Turkish harings. It's not very important, but, you know, be you his eunuch, and your mute I'll be. Mutes were often accompanying eunuchs. Um, and, um, sorry, just turn the volume down. Sorry about that. And um, your mute I'll be where my tongue blabs, then let mine eyes not see. Eunuchs often accompanied by mutes, as it says there. And the guards in the harems were blinded if they blabbed, if their tongues blabbed, if they told what, they, what was going on in the Turkish harems. Um, so that's two little scenes to introduce the play. We've met Orsino. We've met Viola. And now we're going to meet Sir Toby and Maria and, of course, Sir Andrew. Uh, so we're going from mm, quite a bit of seriousness. We've had mention of death. We've had shipwrecks. You know, there's lots of sort of passionate love going on. Um, there's disguise. 
And now we're going into the comedy. We're going into the, uh, the comic plot with Sir Toby, who, look at his opening line. What a plague. I've highlighted it there. What a plague means my niece. Hang on. Uh, just put that, give, give that voice. Oh, what a plague means my niece should take the brother, death of her brother. Thus, I'm sure cares an enemy to life. Eh. Um, so, what a plague, reminding us of the plague. But in this case, he's not interested in the seriousness of the plague. He's interested in... in just he's not interested in death he's interested in life and a plague upon his niece for being so hung up on death um he would much rather get on with living uh with living than bother about people who are dead um look at this i am sure cares an enemy to life care bothering being worried, being taking anything seriously. That's an enemy to life. I want to live. Um, I've written it there. Toby is about the affirmation of life, not death. Um, the good life, to phrase that's used even nowadays and, and, and is used in this play, and I'll, I'll explain it further when I get to it. But, you know, we are immediately moving into the world of Carpe Diem. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I will go through it in detail later. But, uh, you know, generally it's taken as seize the day, grab your opportunity, live life to its full. Um, but Mariah tries to, uh, Mariah, Maria, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll waver between the two, tries to calm him down. By my troth, Sir Toby, you must come in earlier a night. Your cousin, my lady, takes great exceptions to your ill hours. Why let her accept before accepted? She can object as much as I can object. You know, I might just as well object to her. Um, but no, says Maria, you must confine yourself within the modest, modest limits of order. There's no way that Toby is going to limit himself in any way or subject himself to any uh, order. Um, he's not going to confine himself, meaning, uh, Maria means uh, confine, um, hold himself in, bind himself. No, he's not going to do that, but also, of course, he's going to pun. Maria and uh, and he love to play with language, um, and so we get a play on the word confine immediately, meaning fine, as in fine clothes. Confine, I'll confine myself no farther than I am. These clothes are good enough to drink in, and so be these boots too, and they be not. Let them hang themselves in their own straps. So I, you can imagine Sir Toby as a sort of cavalier, um, very often on stage, he would be in big boots, perhaps a colourful jacket, um, and uh, you know reds, blues, greens, a big hat with a big feather. He's 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 got the cavalier spirit. I mean, even though we're forty years before the Civil War, the the Roundheads and the and the Cavaliers, um, and I will give you more detail on that. But but still, the seeds of the Civil War, the the sort of the battle between Puritans, who are mentioned in this play a number of times, the battle between Puritans and those who are of a uh, higher church, those who are um, royalist in nature, um, you know, that, that was already happening in the 17th century, um, as Shakespeare writes. Well, I'm not going to, I, I, you know, that's why he speaks about clothes. That's why he speaks about being fine. He wants to look fine. I will not confine myself. I am already fine. Um, oh, and what else does he do, says Maria? Of course, quaffing and drinking will undo you. I heard my lady talk of it yesterday. And of a foolish night, I've put here foolish is like an epithet for Sir Andrew. An epithet is a, is a word that sort of attaches itself to a name. Um, a, a brave Macbeth, again, some, some of you will, will know that. Um, brave Macbeth, um, and here we've got foolish Sir Andrew uh, that you brought in one night here to be her wooer. So we know we know that there is a foolish night. We know in a moment we're going to find out in the next line. We're going to find out Sir Andrew Aguchi. And we know as well um, that he is there on the pretext of wooing Olivia, of, of trying to um, sue for her hand. Um, that's the basic reason why he's there. But of course, Toby has him there for another reason. We're about to discover what that is. Who's her Andrew Aguchi? Well, he's as tall a man as any is in Illyria. Well, tall, 
I've written there means valiant, but Maria, they love playing with language. Maria is deliberately obtuse here. She's deliberately, ooh, what's his height got to do with it? What's that to the purpose? Um, ah, says Sir Toby, he has 3,000 ducats a year. Ah, oh, so that's why you like him, Sir Toby, is it? That's why you like him, because you think you can use his money. In fact, you know you can use his money. He's going to be buying the rounds in the, in the local uh, hostelries, and he is going to be um, forking out all over the place for Sir Toby. So Sir Toby's going to protect him. Sir Toby needs him. OK, uh, Maria, it's quite right. He's going to spend all that money very quickly. I but he'll have but a year in all these ducats. He's a very fool and a prodigal, a prodigal, somebody who spends uh, a lot very quickly. Um, but Toby defends him. Uh, fie that you say so. He plays with the Valdegan boys and speaks three or four languages word for word without book and hath all the good gifts of nature. No, says Sir Toby. Well, there's all sorts of playing with words here. Not not all of this is going to work with a modern audience. Viol de Gambo is a sort of cello, viola, stringed instrument that you put between your legs. Okay, so we've got a sexual, um, uh, we've got a sexual reference there. Um, possibly, as I've written there, even a pun on boys, gamboys. He likes to play with boys, you know. Um, and um, but also, he's trying to defend him. He speaks three or four languages word for word without book. Well, we're soon going to find out that. He, he can't speak any languages, and so possibly without book, is he didn't actually bother to read any books. Uh, hath all the good gifts of nature. Well, Maria picks up on that very quickly. A natural in Shakespearean times in the 17th century, a natural was a fool, was an idiot. Um, and which is why Maria says, Well, he hath indeed almost natural. For besides that he's a fool, he's a great quarreller. But that he hath the gift of a coward, nice balance in this line, gift of a coward to allay the gust he hath in quarrelling, tis thought among the prudent he would quickly have the gift of a grave. Uh, I've written balance and alliteration there, gift, gift, gust, quarrelling, um, really nicely put together, a gift of a grave, gift of a coward. Um, basically what she's saying is that if he wasn't such a coward and ran away all the time, uh, he's always picking fights, He'd be dead by now, but luckily he's he's such a coward, he runs away very quickly. Um, oh, says Sir Toby, there are scoundrels and subtractors that say so of him. Another mistake, I'm sorry, I, I missed out the S. Yes. Um, subtractors, detractors, people who speak against him... Um, Usually, usually, sort of. Got, I think this line quite works quite well with a little pause and sort of, you know, oh, scoundrels and subtractors that say so of him. Who are they? So, you know, who dares to say something like that? Oh, they that add, moreover, he's drunk nightly in your company. Uh, with drinking health to my niece. I'll drink to her as long as there is passage in my throat and drink in Illyria. He's a coward and a coistrel that will not drink to my niece till his brains turn on the toe like a parish top. Um, <clears throat> it hurts a bit doing that. Um, yeah, excuses. I'm drinking to my niece. <laughs> you know, hey, toast my niece. Yes, let's toast my niece again. Um, niece, cousin, uh, we're not really sure exactly how the two are related, Olivia and uh, Sir Toby. But, you know, anybody who won't drink to my niece, how dare they? Um, you you drink until you're drunk, until your brains are spinning like a parish top, it says there, top used in the village for exercise. Suddenly he sees him coming, Castigliano Volgo, for here comes Sir Andrew Eggyface. So he says the name differently. Again, you can tell that Sir Andrew is a bit of a butt of uh, Sir Toby's jokes. Nobody's exactly sure what Castigliano Volgo means. Basically, watch out, speak of the devil, shh. OK, here he comes. Um, I have to, one has to be careful with the, with the playing of Sir Andrew nowadays, obviously. Things have changed so much. Um, traditionally, he's played as quite effeminate. And certainly in the play, he, he is described as not the most manly of men. Um, and, and I don't make too, much, too many excuses for discussing gender in this way because the play is so much about gender um you know a, a girl dresses herself as a boy and and orsino finds himself very attractive to that boy um <clears throat> olivia 
falls in love with a girl who's dressed as a boy and uh, it, it, there's playing around with gender in, in this play all the time Antonio and Sebastian as we will find out are, are, are very very close it's a sort of courtly love between the two um, Sir Andrew you know traditionally as I say played in a rather effeminate way um, you know uh, I, I don't think I need to make too many excuses for that. I mean, you know, I'm as camp as they come myself, you know, and, and the, 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 it often causes great humour. Um, so here he comes. Sir Toby Belch, how now, Sir Toby Belch? Oh, sweet Sir Andrew. And then she, he sees Maria. Well, he's not very good with dealing with women. Oh, uh, bless you, fair shrew. Not really a compliment. I mean, she is a little mouse. Um, she's described as little throughout the play. Um, but it, it, a shrew is also an ill -tempered tempered woman taming of the shrew uh, another shakespearean comedy um so you know he's not really started very well you can imagine why maria wants to treat him as a bit of an idiot um you too sir she says rather dryly a cost sir andrew a cost andrew hasn't got a clue what that word means um i mean to toby's saying you know woo her talk to her make conversation um but uh, of course um he then uh sir andrew can't understand what he's talking about um what's that a lot of times in this play the word what means who um and so toby deliberately uh, takes it as who and says that's my niece's chambermaid oh good mistress of cost I desire better acquaintance some of the jokes do work nowadays so um, no my name is Mary oh good mistress Mary of cost ha 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 good more jokes no says Sir Toby you mistake knight of cost is front her border woo her assail her um, yeah woo have sex Andrew's quite alarmed by this idea. Uh, oh, by my troth, I would not undertake her in this company. Is that the meaning of a cost? Um, undertake, undertake, take her underneath. Yeah, OK. Um, so another pun there, um, probably unwittingly used by Sir Andrew. Off goes Maria. Well, she tries to leave anyway because she's had enough of this. Um, you know, he, she's tired of this idiot. Um, and so Sir Toby gives Sir Andrew the words to say. And thou let part so, Sir Andrew, would thou might never draw sword again. Oh, a new part so, mistress. I would I might never draw sword again. Fair lady, do you think you have fools in hand? So notice that copying the words, drawing a sword, obviously the sexual meaning there. Remember Romeo and Juliet, if you've studied that, then uh, you'll know about the, the naked weapons at the beginning of the play. Um, quite normal um, sort of phallic imagery there. Oh, no, I don't have fools in hand, says Maria, again, very dryly, because I don't have you by the hand. Um, oh, says Sir Andrew, again... You know, she's playing with words, she's clever, she's witty, Toby's giggling away about it probably, and um, Sir Andrew takes it all straight, he takes it absolutely literally. You know, I have not you by the hand, is a joke. Marry, but you shall have, and here's my hand, so, you know, here we go. Uh, can't understand any of the nuances uh, of this. This is lovely dramatic irony, of course. Now, sir, thought is free if you say so. I pray you bring your hand to the buttery bar and let it drink. Traditionally, she puts his hand on her breast, which of course he, when he realises what's happening, he feels quite uncomfortable about that. Um, <clears throat> well, what, what's that mean, says Sir Andrew? Again, not understanding what's going on, not understanding the linguistic play. Um, oh, it's dry, sir. Dry. Well, it's a dry joke. I'm. Uh, it's a dry metaphor. It's. It's a good joke. But also, um, my breast is dry for you, Andrew, because you have no virility. So there is this. This, as I say, this effeminate uh, side to Sir Andrew in his portrayal. Um, uh, or his no effeminacy is a word I shouldn't use. Perhaps uh, there, there is something that is he is being made fun of for not being manly enough. Let's leave it at that. Um, well, I think so. I'm not such an ass, but I can keep my hand dry. I mean, anybody can keep the hand dry and put it in my pocket. I can wear some gloves. Um, but what's your jest? A dry jest? So, oh my goodness, she's had enough of him. Um, dry, yeah. 
lack of virility, as they say. Oh, are you full of them? Yes, I have them. My fingers ends. I got the joke at the at the ends of my fingers. You, you, Sir Andrew, and now I let go your hand. I am barren. I have no more jokes left. Um, oh, and off she goes. Exit, leaving him complete, completely bemused. And of course, Sir Toby can rather amusingly take pity on him. Oh, night, thou lackst a cup of canary. When did I see thee so put down? We're not drinking little birds here. We are drinking sweet wine from the canaries. <clears throat> well, never, says Sir Andrew. Never in your life, unless you saw a canary put me down. We think sometimes I have no more wit than a Christian or an ordinary man has, but I'm a great eater of beef. I believe that does harm to my wit. Well, beef, apparently, legend has it, makes your brain a bit dull. But I, 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 oft, I always think, you know, beef is a manly meat for men to eat, you know, gnawing great joints of beef. And, uh, it, it, of course, it's completely at odds with Sir Andrew, a great eater of beef. He's trying to make himself out more manly than, than he actually is. Oh, no question, says Sir Toby. And I thought that, I'd forswear it. Here's the difficult bit. I'll ride home to tomorrow, Sir Toby. Oh my God, Sir Toby, terrified now. Can't lose his drinking companion. Can't lose his his wages, his, his money. Um, who's going to buy him drinks if he rides home? No, pourquoi, my dear knight? Oh, some French. Well, Sir Andrew speaks three or four languages, doesn't he? Um, what is pourquoi? Do or not do? How would I have bestowed the time in tongues that I have in fencing, dancing and bear baiting? Had I but followed the arts? Well, he doesn't even understand what pourquoi means. Um, and he... Uh, but he is a courtier. He's a man of court. And he... He uh, entertains himself with the traditional uh, pursuits of a 17th century gentleman, fencing, dancing and bear baiting. Oh, if only we still lived in those days. Perhaps not the, the bear baiting, but, you know, certainly fencing and dancing. Um, Interestingly, we do see references to bear bait baiting. Uh, we do see references to, um, to uh, blood sports and to hunting throughout this play, uh, of course, a, a very traditional um, pastime for gentlemen in those days. Um, we do see Andrew fencing later, well, sort of, and in a moment we're going to see him dancing. <clears throat> so Toby Belch decides to pun on the word tongues, possibly, in Shakespeare's time. It was said tongs, uh, and so we have curling tongs, um, and hence this little in interchange, interchange. Then hast thou an excellent head of hair? Why would that have mended my hair? Well, past question, for thou seest it will not curl by nature. So tradition has it that Sir Andrew has his hair sort of hanging flat against his face, long blonde hair. That's the tradition when he's on stage. Um, and uh, Sir Toby makes fun of this, but it becomes me well enough, does not, flicking his, his lovely flaxen locks. Um, oh, excellent, it hangs like flax on a distaff. I hope to see a husset take thee between her legs and spin it off. Well, uh, flax on a distaff, weaving, weaving flax. Imagine, a, imagine one of those mops, you know those mops where you've got a long stick and you've got those sort of, like, big strands that hang down okay it's a bit like that in a way um you know put the distaff between your legs and uh, bet between the legs of a hussif as i've written there a housewife hussif huzzy prostitute uh and and uh you know the, the sex will spin off your hair. Why will it spin off your hair? Well, if you know anything about uh, traditional syphilis or venereal disease or sexually transmitted diseases, uh, you'll know that um, you used to lose your hair or men, the legend had it that men would lose their hair uh, as a result of um, uh, sleeping around and going to prostitutes. Um, it was also called the French disease. <laughs> Say no more. Um, 
And also, of course, you know, you've got the reference to sex, you know, take, Hussif, take me between her legs and spin it off. You've got the reference uh, again to to uh, a, a, a staff, flax on a distaff and, uh, you know, some sort of uh, phallic imagery. Well, says Sir Andrew, faith, I'll home tomorrow, Sir Toby, your niece will not be seen, or if she be, it's four to one, she'll none of me. Count himself here, I'll buy woos her. So he knows, he knows all she knows after him. And um, she, Olivia does not is not interested in seeing Sir Andrew. Well, of course not. Uh, but no, says Sir Toby, no, he's got to keep him here. He's got to fight really hard to keep him here. Uh, and he says very clearly, no, she'll none of the count, she'll not match above her degree, neither in estate years nor wit. I have heard her sweat, tut this life int man. Um, not match above her degree, neither in estate years or wit. Well, we know that uh, he is very, uh, she is very interested in young boys, we're going to find that out later when she hears about uh, Viola. And also we know that she has interesting ideas about class, that she's not too bothered about crossing the class boundaries. Um, oh, OK, says Sir Andrew. I'll stay a month longer. I'm a fellow of the strangest mind in the world. I delight in masks and revels sometimes all together. I'm a, I'm a gentleman of the court, and, and courtly entertainment uh, was very often masks. Uh, these amazing sort of entertainments that cost lots of money and uh, involved elaborate scenery and elaborate costumes. Um, <clears throat> well, says Sir Toby, I'm good at these kickshawses. Uh, another reference to French there, calcachures. Um uh, I mean, little something. Oh, yes, says Sir Andrew, uh, as any man in Illyria. Yet I will not compare with an old man. Uh, well, I think he means that as a compliment for Sir Toby. You know, experienced, but actually comes out as a bit of an insult. Uh, you're old, mate. Oh, says Sir Toby, and we get a lot about dancing here as we move to the climax of the scene. You know, what is thy excellence in a galliard night? Uh, glossed it there, a lively court dance with five steps and a leap or caper before the fifth, a little jump before the fifth step and says Sir Andrew, I can cut a caper, I can leap with the best of them, uh, and Toby again puns on caper, I can cut the mutton to it um, and I've written there, mutton can also mean prostitute, you know, there's a lot of drinking, sex, food, you know, mutton, prostitutes, drink, dancing. Um, this is the life. This is the life that Sir Toby wants. This is real life. I'm sure care's an enemy to life, remember, he said at the beginning of the scene. Oh, and I think I have the back trip, simply as strong as any man in Illyria. So perhaps a backwards jump, perhaps some sort of flip. On stage, Sir Andrew always does some ludicrous moves that get the audience uh, laughing away as we as i say as we build to the climax of the scene and we go out with great hilarity oh wherefore are these things hid you're hiding your talents like the parable of the talents in the bible um hiding your talents away wherefore have these gifts a curtain before them are they like to take dust like mistress mal's picture no idea who mistress mal is we could guess but more to the point pictures in those days, as I'm sure you know, uh, used to have uh, curtains drawn over them in order to keep the dust off them and uh, they would be revealed when you wanted to view them. Uh, so, live your life by dance. What more could you want, says Sir Toby? What more could you want to do? Why dost thou not go to church in a galliard and come home in a coranto? My very walk should be a jig. I would not so much as make water but in a sink a pace. Sank a pace, French again, sank, five step dance, a bit like the galliard we've just been talking about. Uh, what does that mean? Is it a world to hide virtues in? Oh, I did think by the excellent constitution of thy leg it was formed under the star of a galliard. Oh, says Sir Andrew, it is strong. Does indifferent well in a flame coloured stock. Well, you know, I'm not sure I can see Sir Andrew in a red stocking. Um, he reminds us, of course, that, or, or warns us that we're going to see more about stockings later in the play. Um, but uh, for now, Revels. Shall we set about some revels? A bit of fun. What should we do else? Were we not born under Taurus? Taurus, that's sides and heart. No, it isn't. It's neck and throat. That's what Toby means. But 
who cares? Sir Andrew doesn't understand. And uh, Toby takes him out with this, as I say, this climax. No, sir, it is legs and thighs. Let me see the caper. Ha, ah, higher, ha, ha, excellent. And off they go with Sir Andrew whooping and leaping and giggling and the audience hopefully uh, bursting into applause and laughter. And there we have finished the first three scenes of the play uh, and I will move on to Act 1, Scene 4 in the next video.